Hi, my name is Lauren Dandridge, Principal of Chromatic here in Los Angeles, California. Today, I'm happy to present part of episode six for the virtual lighting design community about equity, particularly in my case for women's search for equity. I wanted to be sure to really start this topic off, especially since it's a concentration around politics of lighting and equity at large, um, really taking into consideration my particular viewpoint, which is that most of the facts and figures that I'm using are uh, from an American context, and that a lot of the companies and entities that have written about it or have published about it and that speak about gender equity uh, are American companies, because that is the context of which I am part of. So I also want to start off by establishing what I mean by equity. And when I say equity, I'm really talking about that middle word in this, you know, very used term of DEI right now. So a fair amount of looking led me to try and find a definition or a series of definitions that I like. And I was able to find one at the University of Washington's glossary in their essentially DEI department. And for them, they're defining equity as the fair treatment of access, opportunity, and advancement for all people, while at the same time striving to identify and eliminate barriers that prevent the full participation of some groups. The principle of equity acknowledges that there are historically undeserved and underrepresented populations that the fairness regarding these unbalanced conditions is necessary and to provide equal opportunity to all of those groups. And I like this particular definition because so much of the work that we speak about in terms of DEI or is kind of vague and really large ideas that's somewhat hard to uh, get a handle on. But these definitions, particularly the equity one, I think feel really grounded and accessible. Uh, but in a climate where we're pushing for recognition in these areas, particularly here in the US, and as we continue to push for generally more widely understood truths like racism or sexism, we need to move beyond just sort of large and vague ideas and really narrow down these ideas to specific definitions and things that we can start to measure other things against. And so for a lot of people, the definition of equity may be somewhat interchangeable with equality. And so to those people, I offered this pictorial example of how we can, you know, delineate uh, equality on the left versus equity. Equity is really referring to giving all individuals fair treatment and equal rights and opportunities. So if you start off by offering all the same privilege and privileges and having all the same rules and opportunities and deploying resources and assets equally, that can sound like a really good inclusion strategy, but really it's not recognizing that employees, uh, individuals are really starting from different starting points. So by treating everyone the same, this the employer is really just reinforcing any sort of inequities that are already there. Equity, on the other hand, is taking the idea of fairness and equality and applying it to the outcomes, not the support or the resources. So with workplace equity, which is what we're talking about here, the politics of having equity in the lighting design community at large, really looks at trying to identify and acknowledge specific needs of demographics, and in our case for this talk, women, or those who identify as women, and using that information to figure out what those struggles or uh, disadvantages might be and putting those in the decision-making process to have a more inclusive workplace. And in a state of equity, once you're able to do that, all the employees are empowered to perform at their very best and they should feel incredibly supported and that they can succeed in this workplace. So in short version, equity, excuse me, equality and an inclusive workplace is the end goal, but equity is the means that you use to get there. But I don't understand, women are far more represented in the workplace than they used to be. We see 
uh, university application and entrance rates for women go getting higher. We see women becoming CEOs all over the place. And that's true. We have seen an increase of women in the workplace over the last 40 plus years. Um, however, the responsibilities that fall on women's shoulders as they've exited the private sphere, or at least partially exited the private sphere and moved into the public sphere and started working outside the home have not changed. So as we see here in this slide, women have started increasing their incomes by going into the workplace. And now we see the proliferation, the proliferation, excuse me, of dual income households. What's not present here is the social and gender norms that are applied to women inside the home and how those have not changed as women have entered the workplace. And okay, so if we started this talk by defining what equity means, what do I mean right now about societal norms or gender norms? Well, social norms, generally speaking, are the rules or governance, governance of our actions based on a societal understanding of acceptable behavior. So if you were able to think back to before the pandemic, the example on the right shows someone touching a pregnant woman's belly. Generally, we understand that to not be okay, right? We know it is unacceptable to touch anyone's body without acceptance, without consent. And yet people do it all the time. That is a breaking down of the societal norm between the person on the right and this person on the left. What's also important about societal norms is that they are contextual based on the time frame that we are evaluating. For example, if you saw someone somewhere, for example, like in an airport wearing a mask prior to 2020, you would think, gosh, that's weird. Why are they wearing a mask? However, as shown by the cartoon on the left, we know that depending on where you are now in this day and age, if you see someone wearing a mask, that societal weirdness or that conspicuousness of someone wearing a mask is gone. It might even be the opposite now where not wearing a mask make you, makes you stand out more. So your behavior is always in reference to society at large and that society at large's view of behavior is what we would call the societal norm. If you couple that with this idea of gender, then you have sort of two, two sets of behavioral norms that are dictating how we live our lives. So the term gender was really popularized in the 1970s by feminists who were trying to really distinguish the roles between male and female uh, behaviors, preferences, and things that were more socially constructed rather than biological. The goal was really to create a counterpoint between uh, popular notions that there are male and female differences that were natural and therefore unchangeable. So these psychologists, excuse me, these sociologists were advancing the idea that gender is best understood as a social system that applies to resources, roles, power, entitlements, and uh, behavior practices that can be perceived as either male, masculine, or female, feminine. Unfortunately, most of these systems that we're talking about, these gender-based systems are deeply hierarchical and they tend to privilege male or masculine. And we also know that this system gets established very early. This classification of behaviors as masculine or feminine starts incredibly early, not just because somehow children are born with this innate knowledge of what is boy, what is girl, but instead it's really societal pressures and norms societal norms and parents really consciously and unconsciously pushing these norms on them. So for example, we buy certain toys that are thought to be girls toys versus boys toys. Uh, gender uh, delineated clothing sections are in all kids, actually every store you go into and sports are even divided up that well, that same way. Uh, but these norms are just one element of the gender system, right? Like we know that gender roles, gender socialization and power relations are all part of society's sort of governed expectations of us. And those expectations 
are sort of cyclical. So as this divide starts to sort of feel larger, you can look at this article by Elizabeth Sweet in the New York Times, where she argues that marketing strategies are essentially just reflecting back to us deeply held beliefs about gender that operate within our culture. And parents are arguing that their daughters and sons like different things. But really, it's this sort of idea that if you don't stick within the prescribed gender norm for your child, so for boys, you can transgress into the, this pink area, this feminine zone, which has really high repercussions because you tend to uh, skew off into homophobic, homophobic culture or ideas. So really trying to make sure that you conform with this, within this idea of gender. So the more that gender becomes segregated, the more that these roles become segregated, the more, the higher, I should say, the peer pressure is to stay within your lane. And unfortunately, that has repercussions, not just for children, but for adults as well. So when you cross that threshold into what is deemed from what is deemed to be masculine into feminine and vice versa, there are social implications. And really what that's telling me is that the two are intrinsically linked. You can't really talk about societal norms and gender norms as if they don't rely on each other. So in another article, this one from uh, Ben Amino, Sislehi, and Lori Heisey, they're arguing that a, a proper definition really takes both streams of thought into account to normalize or to understand the influence of people's actions, acknowledging both the double nature of gender norms, beliefs that are nested in people's minds, but then also embedded in institutions and how they profoundly affect behaviors, shape different access to services. Therefore, gender norms are social norms, defining acceptable and appropriate actions for men and women within a given group or society, a combination of the two. They are embedded in formal institutions, informal institutions nested not just in the mind and are produced and reproduced through social interactions. So maybe it is not the rules of your actual workplace, but maybe it is the community and the, and the social construct of the community of your workplace. So these norms play a role in how women and men's often in, in, in equal or unequal access to resources and freedoms are affecting voices, power structures, and a sense of self. So when we judge women for not asking more, for more, for the raise, for going for the thing, we have to take into account that the societal pressures and gender norms that are incident upon them at all times is not to support that voice. And while researching for information about women's gains in the workplace, everywhere I looked, I saw women are doing great, but things are really hard. Women are reaching the top echelons of business, but at really, really low numbers, or they're not paid equally, or they have severe amounts of burnout. And so I also found these slides where it's really showing the double nature or the double lives women have to lead. We have to be able to perform at a really high level of work competency, but can't ever fully leave that personal sphere or private sphere work that we have been really segregated into by gender and societal norms. And the problem with that is that it leaves women in a really precarious state. We may not be able to work as many hours as our male colleagues. We tend to be paid less, so we have uh, higher financial constraints, and we tend to not be in higher paying jobs. And if for some reason there's a loss of childcare, there's almost not even a question about who's going to stop working. It is almost always the lower paid parent who almost always happens to be the mother. And that's not great. We want women in the workplace and we want them to be succeeding in the workplace. So why does this keep happening and why can, and how can we change them? And really the biggest why is we don't want women burning out. And we know that that's happening. And if the pandemic has showed anything to us, it's that it's happening to women at a higher rate than it is to men. So if you look here on the graph on the right, women are burning out at percentages higher than men in the workplace. And while, and this is from McKinsey 
And even though this is not specific to the lighting industry, it is specific to corporate jobs in America, and it is specific to people who have jobs. And the lighting industry is full of corporations, particularly multi-million dollar ones. And so if we can't put use this to understand our greater understanding of the lighting design industry, then I don't know what else we can. Part of the other problem is that the pandemic put a pressure on women in that they have to be able to balance both home and work life. The problem is that the males, the men in their fields are continuing to advance, which again, leaves the women set back. So they may have been equal upon entrance, but they're no longer equal as time continues. And in this particular case, this clinical professor is saying that I had to take a step back because I had different responsibilities than my male colleagues. But it's not just home life. Women tend to have a disproportionate share of care work, even at institutions. They're more likely to be acting as mentors or committee members or taking on special initiatives that support other people in the work environment. And the problem with burnout is that once it starts to happen, it's really hard to stop. So how can we really understand women's perspective? Well, it really feels like failure when you can't work at the potential that you know you are capable of as an employee, when you can't achieve in all the ways that you want to as an employee, you feel like a failure. When you're not able to serve in your family, whether it's as a mother, as a daughter, as a sister or an aunt in the way that they need you to, you feel like a failure. And so without a support system, either at the work level or at the family level, you tend to just feel like a failure at both. And it's really hard to understand that because McKinsey has also published tons of information about women in the workplace, diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace, and has said many times that companies that are able to make diversity, equity, and inclusion a priority are better off from a business standpoint. In this Forbes article, they're saying that if you can have a diverse workplace, you're more likely to be more resilient when a crisis happens. And the crisis of the last two years has shown us that companies were not ready. Had equitable systems been in place, we might have seen fewer women dropping out of the workplace. We might have seen lower accounts of burnout. And we might have seen companies be able to deal with both a pandemic and the social upheavals of 2020 due to the deaths of Black Americans much better. So how can we start to address this? I propose that we might need to reevaluate the role between employee and employer. Uh, we need to put in place very deliberate and intentional reviews of processes in the company, and then they can eventually help us remove the barriers that are existing that we're trying to address with resources. So if we break down the relationship between who we are as employees and who we are as employers, we tend to not really describe that as a relationship, right? I don't have a relationship with my boss, but you do, right? People are hired to be a part of not just the company, but the community and the culture that that company is trying to foster. And you're doing that through the conduit that might be a hiring manager or an HR department, and by extension, the boss. If we can reevaluate that understanding, the level of communication, the level of being seen, and really allow for a greater percentage of someone's whole self to be brought to the workplace, we might even be able to accommodate those changes and challenges. And maybe there's even parts of that whole person self that can be celebrated in a work capacity. Because we know that isolating people and not acknowledging their onlyness is not successful. Women who are the only of something in a workplace are going to be facing far more challenges. This happens, you know, when you have the only mother in a workplace and she has to constantly early to go get her child? How could she not face extra scrutiny when everyone else is working additional hours that day? How could she 
really succeed when she's asking for non-standard work hours and everybody else is working from nine to five. So we know that just making an environment more inclusive will help with that. But if we also reevaluate all of the aspects of that woman's whole self, we may see that there are parts of her that help business, empathy, kindness, time management, multitasking, emotional support. They all tie back to these ideas of tools that we use in the private sphere or this invisible work that women do and not associating any worth of it in the workplace. But again, referring back to the 2021 Women in the Workplace article from McKinsey, those characteristics help make women phenomenal leaders. Compared with men in similar positions, women managers take more consistent action to promote uh, employee well being. They check in on team members, they're more likely to help manage workloads, and they also are helping to provide support systems for team members who are dealing with burnout or navigating different work life challenges. When managers support employees' well being, their whole selves, employees are happier, they're less burned out, and less likely to consider leaving. If we are going to start making equity a priority, we have to start by addressing how the company is functioning. It's not enough to just sort of talk about creating equity, we have to address the parts of the business that allow things to stay inequitable. So if we evaluate the processes that businesses go through, they tend to track metrics, right? There's no company out there that doesn't know how profitable it is. That's not looking at growth. But I have yet to see a lighting company in the last few years really talk about their diversity metrics or their, equi their equity metrics or even inclusion metrics. If we don't have a place to start, we won't know where we're going. And then if we back out even further, if we want to try and change things, we have to recognize that changing just the people is not enough. We have to change the institution, we have to change the system. So in this particular article from Deloitte, uh, they reviewed that companies that follow in a more inclusive culture are twice as likely to meet or exceed financial targets and six times more likely to be agile and innovative. If we change the gender norms that would require these institutional policies, people's narratives and power relations, we can endeavor to have equity be more transformative. The way that Deloitte is arguing that we do that is to take these simple steps here, not to evaluate people's biases, but instead to really change the structure in the system that allow these biases to be not included, right? We want to keep them separate from the evaluation process. Again, first thing we wanna do is have metrics. So we need to start pinpointing information about the talent. Uh, we would look at how employees are recruited all the way through when they retire. We want to identify and remodel any sort of vulnerable moments that that talent had within their stint at the company. Where were they susceptible to someone's personal decision process as opposed to a more equitable decision process? We want to introduce positive behavioral changes as opposed to saying things that are required of all people at all times, et cetera. And we really want to track the impact. So once you make these changes, make sure you have the metrics to be able to show how and when you met certain goals and then be able to show the effectiveness of the changes you made. And my favorite example, mostly because it's incredibly personal to me, is the creation of the Crown Act, which is in our case addressing inequity for Black women in the workplace. Uh, data supports that the claim that Black women's hair is more policed and policied in the workplace and contributing to a climate where uh, women are basically having different professional barriers. They're not able to succeed as much as their counterparts in the workplace because of their hair. Now, the Crown Act is a now a law. It was a bill proposed by Senator Holly, State Senator Holly Mitchell here in California. And the Crown Act stands for creating a respectful and open uh, world for natural hair. 
and it prohibits race-based hair discrimination, which is the denial of employment or educational opportunities because of hair texture or protective hairstyles, including braids, locks, twists, or bantu knots. Now, creating an environment that specifically makes Black women equal in consideration for hiring, advancement, no matter how their hairstyle is worn, that is equity. Black women were prior to this at a disadvantage because of a social and gender norm that created an environment in which companies or businesses were allowed to weaponize their personal being against them under the guise of professionalism or the status quo. This is changing the system, and in our case, a governmental system, to have an equitable outcome or an equal outcome, which is everyone being eval evaluated for talent and not for how they look or how their hair grows out of their head. So if we go back to the beginning and we really talk about equity as opposed to equality, I would actually make the argument that it's not just about the resources that are given to have equal outcomes, what we're really striving for equity wise is creating a system that eliminates the barriers that were the reason we needed the resources in the first place. So equity is understanding the application of these resources and how they need to be tailored to the individual so that everyone can have successes across a team. But eventually we want to create a community and a culture that removes one person's or one group's personal or historical disadvantages. And that allows that group to function as an employee with equal opportunity for success. That's the definition of equity that I want to continue to promote. I just don't want help because I have been disadvantaged. I want the help now and I want the barrier that is preventing me from succeeding to be removed. But of course, that's a much larger topic. Here are my references for some of the articles that I included in here and for research. Thank you so much.